Welcome to another Planning to Plate, Understanding All Things Urban. And so today is going to be part one of a two-part series focusing on nutrient management on small scale and specialty production. Um, and today we're welcoming Mark Washtachek, who has done quite a lot of some work with our new 590 sheet, um, along with Marsha Deneke. So part one, just to emphasize what we're going to be talking about, um, is going to be primarily focusing on the actual job sheet, um, the background information, how to fill it out, what information you need, um, and then kind of interpreting what those results indicate. Um, Part two, which is going to be in two weeks, um, Marsha and I will be talking a little bit more about the planning implementation um, and the considerations and kind of the conversations to have with producers. Um, so if you do have any questions that pertain to the planning, scheduling, and certifying process, that's going to be in part two. Part one is going to solely focus on the job sheet and understanding the filling out and the the scheduling of what you actually need to do for 590. Um, I also just want to let you know if you want to follow along on the actual job sheet itself. Um, the job sheet is on eFotog and I'll just share my screen briefly here. So um, in eFotog under South Dakota, of course, um, Section four, conservation practice standards, um, go down to nutrient management 590. The document is going to be this one here. So 590 South Dakota implementation requirements, nutrient management, small scale, 2024. Um, and then when you click on this, it's going to come up with the download for the Excel file. So. If you want to follow along, you're more than welcome to. Um, otherwise, you can always come back to this recording at a later date. So before I hand it over to Mark, um, there are a lot of people that may be familiar, but just in case you aren't, um, Mark is a former NRCS um, employee in South Dakota. Um, he started as a technician in Philip um, and then became a soil conservationist in Aberdeen, as well as in Winter. Um, and he was a DC in Martin. He later became the agronomist in the Brookings um, office and then finally ended his career as the area resource conservationist in Brookings as well. Um, Mark has a degree in biology um, and he has a love for plants and gardening for over 40 years um, and in his own garden um, he's done 18 years of no-till. So we certainly have quite an expert working on this and we're very very thankful. So Mark I will go ahead and turn it over to you um, and if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We will have some time afterwards for questions um, and then we'll kind of go from there. So, Mark, I'll let you take it over. Thank you so much. Wow, Rachel, that was uh, really nice of you to tell everybody what I've done. When I pass away, will you come to my funeral and give that same speech? Because it was really nice. I, I can it. certainly do that. Yeah. Oh, all right, I'm writing you down. Uh, that won't be for a while, by the way. Um, so I I appreciate that. And what I'm going to do is um, talk about this job sheet. Um, I was asked to develop the job sheet that could account for the planning and application criteria in the nutrient management practice in a manner that fits with small scale production and uh, or of the common vegetables that we grow in South Dakota. And I, when I heard all that, I said, well, that should be easy, right? No, not really. But, um, but after working with SDSU and our agronomists and being an avid gardener myself, we just might have achieved that goal. And with a bit of my surprise, it helped me a great deal to learn about my nutrient management program. And I'm currently making some adjustments uh, because of what I learned from entering my information in the job sheet. So I think with that, I'm going to turn my camera off because we don't really need that. 
and I'm going to share my screen. Let's see how all this works. Uh, share my screen, and then I'm going to put up on the screen. If I can find the right one here. Yeah, this is uh, version 1.2 of this job sheet. So we've already been through a couple uh, preliminary versions. So I think we've got some of the bug things worked out and some of the questions. And if you, I don't know how you want to handle this, Rachel, but if they have questions, uh, you can interrupt me or you can wait till the end either way. I'm okay with either one of those things. Um, but I am going to just uh, kind of jump into it here. I'm going to, I've got, um, oh, I thought we had a question already. That's just background. Okay, so the way this, there's a, there's a get started uh, page and you can read through all this. This really is set up to document the, the four R's of nutrient management, the right uh, nutrient source, the right rate, the right time and the right place. Most of this is just documented. We're just putting it down. You have to evaluate whether they did those things properly, I guess, if you're looking to see whether they did nutrient management. Uh, but my spreadsheet here focuses on the right rate. And there's a lot of calculations involved, and we don't really even have a, a standard way to look at this when we're gardening. And so we kind of came up with some ideas with uh, cooperation with SDSU. And so you'll see what we're uh, up to here. I think you'll appreciate it. Um, I sure used it and, and learned some things from it. Um, so you can go through and read all this. There are some good examples here of how this calculates a recommendation. And I think you, if you're going to use it or if you're going to uh, recommend producers use it, you need to understand how we do this. And we're going to ask for a soil test. OK, at, they get a soil test, at least one composite soil test for the whole gardening area or multiple soil tests. It, the job sheet can handle either one. But the way it handles nitrogen is straightforward. Uh, like it uses the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide as a source of information. That's what SDSU relies on. And so we are too. And the maximum in there for sweet corn is 120 pounds of nitrogen. And then it says, and then it says to, to subtract off any soil test nitrogen. Well, soil test in this example is 30 pounds, so it's 120 minus 30. Straightforward. Um, Here's the kind of different thing with the P205 and the K2O. Okay, so we use the maximum uh, P205 amount in the Midwest uh, Vegetable Production Guide, which for sweet corn was 100 pounds per acre. And then we have a soil test of phosphorus, not P205, but phosphorus, and it's 10 parts per million. So we do a conversion. The 10 parts per million is converted to 44.58 pounds per acre. And then we subtract the 100, what we need for sweet corn, minus the converted value. And that gives us our recommended value. And I won't go through the, the potash one. It's the same exact setup. Um, we convert the parts per million to potash, and then we subtract. So those are examples of how this spreadsheet works. Of course, you've probably already realized that nutrient management on a crop land scale, we use yield goal. And here, yield goal isn't involved in any of the, these calculations as an example. So you can see what we're using uh, is the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide, sort of like it was the amount that the crop would use and then that that for maximum production you might say so it's like a crop use number it's not a crop use number but it's like that in the way we calculate this out worked out pretty well we're we're happy with the estimate that's the other thing i call this file uh my name on it is small scale nutrient estimate and i think that's what we're doing we're making an estimate and you'll see as we go through the examples, why I would say that. Um, all right, so we have an inventory sheet, a nutrients sheet, and we'll go through both of those and do an example 
Um, here are the people that helped us from SDSU. They all have their PhDs, in, um, extension, horticulture, that kind of thing. field specialist. Um, there are a lot of links in here for gardeners that might be useful uh, if they're trying to find information about growing different vegetables or a thing with flower or disease or so on. So quite a few links in here and a disco. You're on your own when you use it. It's kind of something you might, we might we think it's right. We think it's uh, a good estimator, but there might be a mistake in there somewhere. We don't think so, but they're not. Okay, so let's get on with it. Garden inventory. You got to know what land you're talking about because this is going to give you a, a recommended rate to put on feed. Okay, because gardening is so small. Uh, we got one field. You can put one field in here. So I'm going to put field one, and you notice, okay, now I can put a second field in here, and so on. I can put up to 10 fields in here. Um, you put the length and the width. The important thing is that you get the square feet of what is being grown in field one correct. In other words, if it's a circle, make sure the square feet comes out to the right number of square feet. In this case, it would be 1,000 square feet. Uh, you can do the calculations on triangles and square and circles and so on. Point is, get the square feet right. It's the growing area. It's the area that the vegetables are going to be grown on and the area that's going to be fertilized. That's an important thing. Uh, there, I have an area to keep track of, control traffic areas, uh, walk areas, driving areas, so on. If you want to keep track of that to make sure you've got the acreage of your entire garden or farm or whatever, uh, these don't come into the calculations at all. And let me show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead to this notes tab in the spreadsheet. So there's a place you can just put information, whatever you want to put. So in the notes, I wanted to show you why I'm going to put the numbers into this spreadsheet the way they're, they're entered. Um, you would be working with a farm or a garden or whatever, uh, and you know, used similar thinking, but uh, here's my garden. It's a three terraced um, level. Each section's level. Each section is uh, show you a picture of what why why I have. So here's the three levels, but I've got walkways between each level that I walk down through. I never plant anything in it. Um, good examples here. I just just planted. This was just planted, and so here's my walkways. I am not going to put that square footage into the potatoes or into the tomatoes or peas or whatever. So make sure that you get um, a correct square footage of the plants that you're growing. That's the important thing. Um, so with that, you can put anything you want in here. I put my soils information in here. Here's my harvest. First harvest of corn on 24 plants. Um, yeah, this nutrient management works. I just put in a drip irrigation system last year in my garden after about 23 years of living here. So yeah, and my soils information's in here, all of that. So let's go back and you enter your fields in here. And so now what I, I really want to do is rather than you watching me um, enter information, I am going to use my personal garden here, and you know what the kind of setup is. So let's go through it now. The first thing you do under the garden inventory is fill out the blue cells where you decide whether or not you're, you want this in acres or 1,000 square feet. Many recommendations for gardens come in 1,000 square feet units. So I've got that checked, but you can go to acres just as easy. And at any time you can flip back and forth. Uh, the answer will be in the units you chose. Mine, I've got uh, the three terraces. There's one, I put potatoes in on both sides of my walkway. And the second is onions, peas, carrots, corn and beans, and then other ones, tomatoes and peppers. So you can see how I filled that out and the square footage. 
Next thing you do, this is actually pretty fast and straightforward. You have to get a soil test. You get one soil test uh, for a composite for the whole area, that's fine. Or you get multiple soil tests. If you get one soil test, just put it in on the first line, which this is what mine was last year. Um, I've got the organic matter is high, the pH is 7.2, and so on and so forth. So you just put your numbers in here. Put in Olson or P, don't put in Ol Olson or Bray, don't put in both. Um, and then you can record uh, additional information, which in my case, I did have a soil test because I wanted to know what the, uh, the uh, contents of the soil for these other elements were. And that these aren't in the calculations at all. They're optional. Um, just and you don't have to even view that section of this. Now this is the determined vulnerability uh, section. Mine, we use an NRCS leach index, so you know how to use that. I assume we can use this link to read about how to determine that for the garden. Mine's all low. I'm not over an aquifer here in Brookings. Uh, the runoff. So this is new in the gardening part of this. We consider the runoff using these uh, characteristics, the soil texture. Uh, mine was silty clay loam, by the way. Um, slope of land, mine is zero, a terraced at level. Amount of cover, I always have cover on mine. You can, you saw what I didn't show you. The, I did show you the picture of the cover crop quickly, but in the fall, it's totally covered. Um, mountain timing of nutrient application, I split apply my nutrients as the season goes on. And what about, let's see, the surface water. I don't have surface water for a over a mile, maybe two miles. And there's all grass in between that would catch anything that would run off. But I don't get runoff on my garden. I've been here 20 years in this garden and never had any runoff. So I'm low. The only thing I fit in is the last thing, high pH soil levels. I do fit that. I have 105 parts per million phosphorus. Okay. But so I'm going to consider all those and I'm going to put myself in the low category. Uh, that means that I'm going to limit my phosphorus P or P205 application to the Midwest uh, Vegetable Production Guide maximum amount. Well, what is that? Well, for potatoes, here's the list of them. Potatoes, it's 3.4 for nitrogen. I'm not I'm not talking about that. We're talking about phosphorus here. It's 3.4 pounds per thousand square feet of P205. I'm going to limit to that. Well, I'm not going to put on that much or any more than that. It just gives me some flexibility when I'm using organic matter uh, like manure and compost and that kind of thing. Um, soils, connect, uh, link to web soil survey to find out what your soils are. And then the last thing really here we're dealing with is you, if you have fertigation, if you mix fertilizer in the water that you apply and irrigate with, you can deal with that by creating your own fertigation fertilizer. And it's very simple. We won't do that here in this training, but I will use that, uh, create a custom blend in the next part here. Um, also, if you, when I lived in Aurora, our parts per million of nitrogen in our water was 15 real high. And so if I irrigated with that water, I'd be putting on 15 parts per million uh, of nitrogen. So you can put that in here. And then when you deal with adding the irrigation water, then it will add that much nitrogen to the uh, application. So, all right. And then, uh, oh, there was one more thing. If you're a no-till farmer, which I am, and last year it was 16 years, I think, that I did no-till on this garden in a row. Uh, you put that information in here. It's going to add 30 pounds, like um, our, our crop nutrient management uh, process does. Add 30 pounds per acre of N to the recommendation if it's no-tilled less than seven years. More than seven years, it's not going to add that 30 pounds of re a recommendation. Um, so. And that's the inventory. I've entered all that information. I've entered the inventory uh, for my fields. So then you go to the nutrient tab. 
And with the nutrients tab, it's going to lay out your fields that you've already put in here. It's going to tell you how big they are. And then what you need to do is fill in the blue cells. So right away, I put in what year I'm talking about. And I'm still in 1,000 square foot uh, units for my garden. So if I don't have uh, a, this one. If I don't have a crop in here, you can enter the vegetable group or the crop. It doesn't matter one or the other. I like to enter the crop that shows me what I'm what I'm growing, even though the group will show a whole bunch of different crops. So if I put you know, and you notice when I don't have that in here, the recommendations blank, the the soil test is blank, and so on. If I come in here and I think this is carrots, then it brings over my soil tests and it brings and it makes the recommendation from the Midwest vegetable guide. So and here's an explanation of how it's making that recommendation. Again, it's we already went through that. So I'm going to go through it again. Um, yeah, so you put in your crop that is in your field, which you're going to grow. And it uses the soil test, and it'll give you a recommendation. All right. So then, what's this over here? Total applied pounds. Well, it's it's summing up. Here's nitrogen on my potatoes. I put in a total of 1.89 pounds per thousand square feet. Where did you get that? I listed then all. This is then the application during a year. I listed everything I put on that field. Okay, and I said when I did it, I said, how did I apply it? And then the most important thing here in this calculations is I told it how many pounds did I put on. If you're going to use this, you're probably going to need some sort of scale. And at least the first year you go through this, start weighing what you're putting up, especially with uh, fertilizer. Um, I had to weigh my manure and compost because I wasn't that good at estimating it to start with. So I put on horse manure in the fall the year before. I have always done that. Actually, after using this spreadsheet, I'm going to take a break on that. I'm going to not, not put that back on. Why? Because my levels of phosphorus are going up, and they're high already and still going up, and so is my uh, potash. And also, uh, my pH is 7.2. If it came down, it wouldn't hurt me a bit. So both those reasons oh and my organic matter is already high it's playing high so yeah so i learned something by doing this anyway i put in the you select your there's lots of choices here um to select from a bunch of organic materials i've got uh, manures i've got we've got uh, then the, the commercial fertilizers uh, that you could um, buy and apply. If there's something not on here that um, you want to account for, so for example, I I put on this 13, 13, 13 that didn't have that in the list. Okay, I just bought it at Walmart probably or Runnings or somewhere, and I was using it as starter. So I came in here and I just put. Okay, it's a dry fertilizer. Uh, it's 13, 13, 13. I had to come up with a name. And then the percent nitrogen, P205 and K2O. And then it knows if I said dry, I want pounds per pound. If I said liquid, it wants pounds per gallon. Well, how would you know pounds per gallon? Well, weigh a gallon of it and subtract the container, and that's how many pounds per gallon. It also says that on the label, almost every liquid product that you would buy. So you can create your own custom blends. Um, yeah. So if, if your fertilizer is not on here, then create a blend. And, and if you're talking about blending like urea and AMS, I did that this year. Well, here's a good example of how to actually come up with the numbers that need to go in the spreadsheet. And it really doesn't matter which um, fertilizers you're Blending this example will help. These examples will help you figure that out how to come up with the numbers. All right. So I put in 
all of my information and my composting is I take off the uh, material from the garden in the fall, the viney stuff that's left, uh, the tomato uh, residue that's left, and I compost that. Within a year or two, I bring it back and put it all back in the garden. I'm not sure I really should account for that here because if I just left it lay, I wouldn't be accounting for it. But I have accounted for it here uh, because it's compost. And I want to see how uh, the spreadsheet would handle it. And so after entering all of this information in, then I'm going to go up here and, and here's my pounds of nitrogen applied. That's what I actually physically put on that field. Okay. So I put on a total of 0.38 pounds of N on that field. But here's the important part to, to compare it to anything. Our recommendations is in pounds per thousand square feet. So I need to get it to pounds per thousand square feet. So that's what this does. It converts. If you had acres selected up there, it would convert it to pounds of N applied per acre. Okay. So this comes up with the number 1.89. That's a sum of the pounds applied of nitrogen per thousand square feet. I can now compare that back to what was recommended, 2.6. Um, and the two, remember, the 2.6 was the maximum from the Midwest Vegetable Guide minus my soil testing. So I actually could have put on another 20, I don't know what percent, that is 10, 15 uh, percent, and, and got myself up to the uh, recommended rate. I was under applying my N. And that's okay. I grew a decent crop of potatoes. I have no problems with that. So you don't always have to be at this maximum uh, to grow good vegetables. I'm just comparing them and showing you where I'm at. I was under, apply, under applying on my onions, under applying on everything except peas. They recommend actually a tiny little bit of N. I, I, surprised me. Um, and because of the organic matter I was putting on, I'm up to a half a pound of N per thousand square feet, a little over that. Um, there's not much I can do about that. And I'm going to show you a bit out here of the peas. I can I get rid of the horse manure. I can get rid of that. I don't really need that. I'm going to keep putting my compost back on. I'm going to get rid of the 13, 13, 13. I don't really need that. But I'm not getting rid of my grass clippings, and they put on a little bit of phosphorus. That's uh, these numbers over here. And so I'm still going to put on these phosphorus, uh, num this uh, amount of phosphorus with my grass clippings because I use it as weed control, and it works perfectly. Um, so there are things I can change, and there's things I can't change or won't change, you might say. Uh, let's see. We were talking nitrogen. I'm sorry. Phosphorus, it, it's a good example of phosphorus because here, I don't recommend phosphorus on any of these fields. Why? Because I already got 105 parts per million, and yet I'm putting on a bunch of phosphorus because of the organic matter. So I'm going to make a little bit of a change there on some of that, but I'll still be putting on phosphorus because of the um, compost and the grass clippings. So I think it's fairly easy to understand, fairly easy to compare what you got there. Um, I'm not going to go through every field. You guys can set up your own uh, scenario, your own garden, whatever. There'll be a button in here that says show additional information. There was a request to be able to, to have the math done where you subtract the difference between the applied, recommended, and applied. So it's 2.6 minus 1.89 leaves you 0.7. Could have put on 0.7 more pounds. Here I over applied by half the pound. So it does the math for you. And then this shows you what that maximum Midwest vegetable production guide number is for N and P205. Uh, displays that here. So can be in, in, information that you could use if you're trying to see if someone is following the nutrient management standard. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how to determine that in this video. And so we've got that.
All right. Custom blend. I showed you that, didn't I? So we don't have to go back through that again. Um, the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide Nutrient Recommendations. Here's what was summarized by Christine and did a great job of doing it. And here are these maximum numbers for N, P205, K20, and the groups and some information. This is helpful, actually, if you're growing um, onions, you know, you can, read, you can pop over here and read through this and see what they recommend. There's also a link to the Midwest Vegetable Guide uh, here at the top. Okay, and I showed you the notes page and the, the data. Here is actually the, if the data that we used uh, use in this. And if you do a custom blend, it creates the table up here for you. Um, you can actually modify the cells in blue by adding uh, organic, um, I guess I would stick organic uh, fertilizers in here and then I would stick commercial fertilizers in here. And if you run out of room or something, just keep going. I mean, it'll just put them, put them in there for you. The reason, okay, let me explain how we handle the organic fertilizers. Let's take my horse manure, for example. It has four, it's estimated to have four tenths of a percent nitrogen, okay? four tenths of a percent nitrogen in the horse manure. Man, that could be all over. You really want to know? Get it tested. But I don't think too many gardeners are going to get their horse manure tested every time they get something from the farmer or next to them or whatever. This is a reasonable estimate, but not all that's available the first year. So we went and did a little um, discussions with SDSU and our people, and we came to the conclusion that we're going to use 35% of these uh, manures, not chicken, but the rest of them, 35% is available the first year. And, and so that will um, there be the difference, 65%, that becomes available over the next three, four years, but we're not accounting for that. Well, that's all right. This deals with one year and how much N is available the first year. I can put it on. So just a good explanation of that. Uh, same thing with these organic materials here. Uh, how much uh, estimated percent available nitrogen? Um, and let's see. Okay, so that's, there's nothing really else in here you can or, or need to change. Um, it's got a whole bunch of data calculations. So. This is the part that you might be interested in making a change to it sometimes. Um, probably not. The conversions, um, here's how convert parts per million of phosphorus to pounds per acre of potash, or excuse me, um, phosphate. And the formula is there, and here's the multiple location factors. So it's all spelled out here how it works. And so the reason it has to be converted is because this is only the element phosphorus. This is um, phosphate and it has addition weight in it of oxygen and so on. So um, I didn't show you this. This is something I put in there for myself. You can use it if you want. If I have a recommendation for potatoes of urea of back in that nutrient sheet of 0.5, I put in there how many put on 0.5 pounds to be applied to the field. Well, I want to know how many ounces that is uh, so that I can weigh it out if it's a real small number. And so I did this little conversion thing. It's not a big deal. You can do the math or you can stick your numbers in here too. I did this because I ruined my wife's flower, flower pots. I didn't ruin them, but uh, kind of burn them a little bit. I like to use some horse manure because we use the same soil. We used the same potting soil for 23 years now here at this place. And of course, 
the organic matter level or it breaks down. I want to add some organic matter to it. And um, so I put this in there. How many pounds of nitrogen do I want to apply from what source? And it actually, how many pots do you got? It actually calculates out uh, the total pounds that I need and the pounds per ounces per pot. So I actually can weigh this stuff out and it works out well. We had beautiful flowers last year. And, uh, yeah, and still continue to add organic matter starter and some miracle and that stuff to these flower pies. Okay, I don't know what just popped up there, but it was something. And I have actually kind of gone through everything I intended to. So, Rachel, I'm going to turn it back to you and see if there's any questions or I don't know. Thank you, Mark. That was awesome. We did have one question come in um, about recommendations for a flower garden. Um, is that something that is in the Midwestern Growing Guide or something you had talked about with SDSU? I got to think for a moment. It seemed like, oh, there is a link in here, I think, to flower, general cut flower information. I haven't read that one, but you know what? I don't know your answer because I've been focused on, when I go to that Midwest vegetable guide, I'm focused on vegetables. So I can't, have, I, I can't give you an answer. And Marcia might know the answer, but there are numbers out there because I have seen them. I don't know which publication it's in. That's, I think, actually where I took my 100 pounds of nitrogen from, or, or close to that, from one of the, from just reading. Yeah, I don't think the Midwestern Vegetable Guide specifically has recommendations. Because, um, yeah, looking at the rough outline, I don't see any. Um, but there are, there are, uh, resources out there and you know perhaps that's something we also change or adapt a little bit later on um, we definitely have a lot more cut flower producers in the state um, I would say yeah. I, I would say with cut flower producers from my experience they may not be as interested in nutrient management because there is a great deal of fertilizing that happens with cut flower businesses. Um, and so it might be rather difficult for them to meet specifications sometimes. But if you do have a flower producer out there that is interested, we can certainly work through that together with Mark, myself and Marsha, um, you know, and definitely kind of pilot it, um, kind of like a lot of things with urban. It is a bit of a case by case basis. So something we have to think about in the future. Wonderful. Um, does anyone else have any questions pertaining to the estimator or um, anything that Mark could go over if there's a little bit more detail needed? Hey, Rachel, I'll jump in here. This is Rob McAfee. Um, uh, yeah, up at the national office here, uh, small scale urban agriculture coordinator. I uh, love the presentation and the work that South Dakota has done to make nutrient management relevant for smaller operations. So nice job to you all. Impressive. My question is, um, is it universal in South Dakota that soil tests are providing nitrogen levels here on in my area in Maryland, East Coast? Um, our soil test does not come back with a, a nitrogen. Um, recommend or uh, a nitrogen analysis. So is that universal in your area? Um, since I sent in two tests for my garden uh, in the last couple of years and learned a lot about them, you actually can choose whether you want nitrogen to be tested or not. There, uh, the place I sent mine to has probably a, a dozen or more choices as far as what do you want tested for. Uh, it's in crop situations, it's absolutely common. Uh, you know, we don't let uh, any recommendations go out without a nitrogen test. But 
So for gardens, I would say uh, you can get them without, but um, it's easy to get them with. I, I guess I'm not sure why they do them without, because it's, to me, a pretty important thing over here. Um, we get over there, you probably, do you leach away all the nitrates? Is that why you don't worry about what's in the soil? Here, we don't always leach away the nitrates that are in the soil from the year before. There's carryover. My, mine was 34 pounds of um, nit nitrogen in the soil last year. I did it this year, and it was 54 pounds. We had a real dry fall, and we didn't uh, run the nitrates down into the soil because it was almost a drought over here in the fall. So we we uh, account for it, yes. Pretty common. Okay. Excellent. And then uh, just in terms of, uh, uh, you know, applicability in other states and regions, I'm curious if you're working with the Central Tech Center at all. Uh, the name Adam Reed comes to mind if you all are working with him to, you know, take your good work and see if it'll be useful for others. Marsha? <laughs> I can, I can, I can also, and Marcia, you chime in too. I don't believe we have taken this to any of the tech centers yet. This is kind of like its big debut today, um, <laughs> so it could definitely be something we we do. Marcia, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, we've we've kind of talked about it with the people at the at the tech centers and some of the other. Um, um, state agronomists are kind of interested in what we're doing, but we're starting with you guys first, make sure we get all the bugs worked out of it. And then, you know, um, we'll, we'll go from there. Got it. Well, great work as normal. South Dakota is leading the way. So good work, y'all. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Um, there was another question. Ryan asked, will we be covering how 590 certification and over application tolerances? So that is going to be talked about in part two, which is going to be in two weeks. Um, everyone should have that team's invitation. If you don't, let me know. Um, I'll hand it over. With this type of 590 with small scale, um, it is going to pose some different challenges from large scale. So that's why we did want to split it into two parts, because it is a little bit of a um, more complex situation, especially when we aren't working with a lot of hard science as we do with larger scale. Um, so we'll definitely talk about that. We're also making some separate guidance so that our field offices can have something more in hand when they're doing this. Um, so yeah, tune in for that in two weeks. Rachel, if you don't have questions, I got a couple more comments I'd like to make, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah we have plenty of time. So you go ahead. If questions come out, please just put them in the chat and we'll address them afterwards. So go ahead, Mark. Okay, okay. well, it, 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 this won't take long, but by doing this, I've been working on it for more than a year and on and off, and I've worked with several people that have gardens, and I got interested in, you know, what are the variations of gardening out there? And I've come to the conclusion that if you've got 100 gardeners, you've got 100 types of gardening. I mean, everybody has their own method and their own mindset and their own uh, methodology, whatever. So uh, the first gal I worked with, was working in a big garden and she was growing, I don't remember, 150 tomatoes or something. And holy cow, you know, I've never even heard of that. Well, why she was doing that is because her production was quite low, I think. Her plant, she told me she'd have a problem with her plants and 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 cracking on the on the tomatoes. And she told me all this stuff. Okay, well let's get a soil test. Well, come back. Her phosphorus parts per million were, if I remember right, right about 800 parts per million phosphorus. So I started researching that, and sure enough, everything she told me was going wrong was uh, a, a, probably attributed to the extreme level of phosphorus. So there's one example. Um, that was out in the country, had this lot that was used for cattle uh, years, years ago, and now just looked really nice to put her garden in. All right, the next guy I worked with got a, got a soil test. He, he didn't put it any fertilizer. Well, she was putting fertilizer on, I must say that. She was putting fertilizer on, but it didn't seem to have much of an effect. Um, it was her issue also because the plants weren't growing properly. 
the next guy I worked with, he is, he don't put any fertilizer on. He's, he's uh, got a pretty high organic matter level in his garden. He rents his place. So he just took over this one area and started growing vegetables in it and just uses some manure that's available. But he doesn't put on anything else. Well, what I'm, why I'm saying this is because there is such a difference in every person that's gardening. And are they going to use this and save a whole bunch of money? Uh, probably not, because I did, don't know if I showed you this, but in mine, I calculated how much money I put into manure, or manure, into fertilizer. It's only $10 a year or something. It's more than that because I had to take my trailer out and get my manure from the guy. And so I didn't account for the, some of the cost. But I mean, I'm not going to save a lot of money doing this. I'm not going to save a lot in the environment. I don't have any runoff. I don't have that. What, why did I do it? I learned a lot and I'm going to make some changes because I think my plants will do better and be more productive on this small little garden I got. And that makes me happy if I'm getting higher production and actually putting on the right amount and kind of fertilizer. So there, uh, that's what I wanted to bring out. So next, so the, experience that I've had uh, with other people doing this and everybody's different but I think learning something about the way you're handling your garden nutrient management uh, I think everybody can learn something and probably will make some adjustments to get it fine-tuned. Thanks Rachel. Thank you. Thank you Mark. And I think it's definitely a good sentiment to go into our next planning to play in two weeks is everyone is going to be very different. Um, everything is often a case by case basis. Um, and a lot of our smaller scale producers are interested in the education portion of it. Um, you know, the cost share benefits they can receive and the conservation aspects are certainly important as well, but a lot of these producers haven't taken soil tests before. So just sitting down with um, our field staff and going over soil tests are going to be a huge step from where they were. So there's definitely some great benefit in investing in 590 with a producer and sitting down so they really understand the process. So we have uh, about 10. Oh, go ahead, Mark. I'm just going to throw out one uh, additional thought there as you what you were saying there. Our area agronomists, uh, I know Eric um, well, and I, you know, I know his place out there. He's helped me. I've helped him on different things. And, you know, if you need somebody to help you understand soil tests and, you know, what they're telling the producer, you've got, you've got good agronomists in the area that just give them a call and say, hey, I got this soil test. Is, is this salt level too high or? What do you think about uh, putting on sulfur in this case to reduce this or that uh, pH and so on? Call them. They can help you. Yeah. Absolutely. We did have another question come in. Do you think there is much difference in the fertilizer needs when you're doing a composite sample versus doing multi-species gardening and taking multiple samples? So are you going to have a significant degree of difference if you do one composite sample in your garden versus multiple soil samples, in your opinion? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that because I never took multiple samples. I mixed all my samples together. Thought about it considerably, uh, but then I'm starting to think the cost of this for me, I wasn't getting the cost share. Uh, would go up considerably. And I just don't know that I, I think I got enough information from doing one composite sample. So I don't know the answer to your question, but if whoever asked that, if they get somebody to do multiple samples, it would be interesting. Let me throw out one other thought. I rotate, I did not uh, show you that, but every one of these tiers, there's two sides to my walkway, it gets rotated in year after year so i never grow the same plant 
uh, most of them have a six year uh, cycle back to uh, rotation. The potatoes are every three years, just because we really like potatoes and French fries and whatever. So uh, having said that, by wrote, by growing the different crops on every level, when I mix my samples up, I think I'm probably, I think there is a, uh, I don't think I need to take multiple samples. I don't think it would show me that much difference in my uh, garden. In other gardens, if you're cropping the same crop every year after year after year, and then there's like tomatoes, and then over here, strawberries that you're cropping on the same land. Yeah, that would probably show different results. I would recommend when planning, use use your planner. Um, use, <laughs> sorry, a blank. Use your planner knowledge um, and work with the producer. As Mark said, you know, there are producers that, you know, they might have multiple high tunnels. Um, and in their high tunnels, they are religiously planting one crop um, or two. So it would make sense then to have a soil test for one high tunnel, um, another soil test for another plot. So use your best planner judgment. We'll talk about some of the uh, considerations when we're actually contracting 590 within your conservation plan. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to be a little bit different for each person. And the feedback that you'll get from working with your producers as well as working with the sheet yourself will certainly be good to help adapt this as we move forward. So that's good. All right, is there any other questions out there? Thank you all for joining today and thank you so much, Mark, for all of your work with this, um, as well as Marcia. I know this has not been an easy task and I have been very thankful to have both of you on this to, to do just about all the work. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. And hopefully, Mark, you have a little bit of time to go golfing now. <laughs> Um, I am actually heading out as when we get done. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you again, everybody. And uh, we'll close out today. And Mark, have have a great golf trip. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, you did a good job, Rachel. Thanks. <laughs>